I'm going to be chatting to Jessica Mass, who's the aftercare director at OUR, which stands for Operation Underground Railroad. They do amazing work with survivors of human trafficking all over the world. Hi. Hello. Welcome, Jessica. I think we might as well just go with it because it's almost on the dot of 6 p.m. here in London, which I think is 10 a.m. for you there in in California. Is that okay? You ready to go now? Ready to go. Great. Well, first of all, welcome. Um, and everyone, this is Jessica Mass, the lovely Jessica Mass, who is the Global Aftercare Director for OUR. OUR stands for Operation Underground Railroad. They do incredible work in 26 countries around the world. So Jessica, could you start by telling us what you do in your role as Aftercare Director? Yes, it's so great to be here with you. We love your campaign and everything that you guys are doing. So just a brief overview of OUR. We were founded in December of 2013. And our founder's name is Tim Ballard, and he was former Homeland Security for 12 years. So our background and our roots really lie within law enforcement and government, and that's kind of how we got started. People can learn more about that at our website as well. So my role as the aftercare director is working with the law enforcement and government before rescue happens. We make sure that we have vetted partners that we're working with. So we go in before an operation when the ops team has said this is a country or an area we're going to be working in. And then we find established aftercare homes and partners and wraparound services. So before anybody ever even hears about a child being rescued through the support of OUR, we're on the ground working with different people. Um, our overall model has been to find those homes that are already established, that understand the specific culture, the language, and the needs of the children. We feel like people that are in the country living there either long term or are local to that country are going to know the needs better than we could ever know. And yes. so we want to honor them and yes. partner with them. I think that's so important because... You know, it, it is all about, you know, I think it is working with the, with, with the local people, with the people that understand the context of that city, of that town, um, and, you know, the language. And, you know, they are the ones that really understand the context of what's happening to, especially to the, to the victims and then survivors of human trafficking. Yeah. So, yeah. Can, sorry. Can you tell us, um, you know, do you, do you, have you seen an increase in the need for rehabilitation services due to COVID-19? Yeah, unfortunately, COVID-19 has been horrific for children being abused. Part of it is because children are in front of screens so in such a increased amount of time right now. And because of that, traffickers are trying to find children there was a child that we um, were helping support with some of the aftercare recently, but the child was basically being recruited through a children's game because it had a messenger um, part of that game. And so you have a child, a six to seven year old that is being recruited through these types of games and that's in their own home. And I think we kind of used to have that idea of if we can keep kids in our home, then they're safe because they're under our care. Um, I've heard so many of my friends and family say things in the past of, we want our home to be the home where everybody comes, where all the children want to play and hang out because then we'll know that they're safe. And I think as situations like COVID-19 have happened, where you now see that there are all these different platforms that traffickers are using to groom children it is not just are they in my home, but what are they doing while they're in my home? Is my child safe in front of their computer? Is somebody monitoring them? Am I aware of what games they're playing and who's trying to reach out to them? So I think that there's a variety of ways that COVID-19 has affected the safety of children. And I think as parents and caregivers become more aware of those things, then we can help keep them safe on 
a more global platform now because that is what it is, is you have a child that might be in the United States, but you have a trafficker that's trying to get them to send explicit pictures that is in Thailand or another country. So yeah, and, and so it's, it's really educating parents for the signs to look out for and what they can do to prevent it from happening. Yeah, yeah, and I think uh, one of the things too for parents is have those conversations with your kids now. Be willing to have the uncomfortable conversation of if somebody tries to force you to send a picture or they're doing these different things you know, go over grooming behaviors with your kids so that they can be advocates for themselves as well. And then also so that that conversation is started so that when a child is trying to figure out even the language to say that somebody is trying to make me do these things and I'm uncomfortable with it so that that conversation's already started and children feel comfortable to come to their parents because they know they've already had that conversation yeah, that's that's so wise, and um, and I think I think you're right. It's it's the more you can prepare your child, the more you can make them aware about what is unacceptable and shouldn't be happening. The more it empowers them to think, well, this this is wrong. You know, you shouldn't be saying this to me. You shouldn't be asking this of me. Um, and obviously, if they feel they can go to their caregiver, they can go to their to their parents. Then again that empowers them um, and I think that's why it's so important the work you're doing the work it's penalties doing to to actually say you know this shouldn't be happening and these are all the precautions you can take to protect your child to protect others in your community absolutely yeah and I think the common question that comes up when people start to learn about human trafficking and specifically is this real and then come to the realization that this is happening and it's not just in other countries but it's in our own backyard is now what what can we do now and I think that one thing that every single person can do is help educate themselves help educate their friends and help have those conversations with their children so that they do know what to do and I think it's been interesting, even through COVID-19, some of the kids that I've been working with have talked about how they had taken one of our trainings or they learned about OUR, one of the other amazing anti-trafficking organizations that are out there right now. And they said, they've said to me, because we know what's happening, we're talking to our friends about this now. And so we have this amazing group of abolitionists that are all teenagers that get told so often that they can't make a difference in the world or they're too young and you have these amazing powerful teenagers that are rising up and they're saying we're not too young we're going to find out what the issues are and we're going to help keep us safe and our friends safe and because they've learned about the global hotline or or NICMIC or different places where they can report then you have people that are in junior high and elementary or high school being able to say, I can at least tell my teacher, I can at least call this hotline, I can have a conversation with my parents. So I would say that um, that is one of the most encouraging things to me is to see this next generation say, not on our watch. So I think as the people before me and before our generations have paved paths of freedom um, and we continue to do that. And then I see this other generation rising up in strength and power to be able to also do the same thing and, and to take it further. Yeah, that's so encouraging. And I think it's great to hear that, you know, it's happening in, you know, that schools are also educating and beginning to take that step to educate as well. Yeah, um, that's been a huge change. I think uh, when we first started, um, which wasn't that long ago, in 2013, the narrative that I heard very often was, we don't want our kids to hear about this. We don't know how to have those conversations. And then I think as teachers and school administrators have gotten more aware of the different things that happen, they've also been willing to say, we want our kids to now be educated. 
Yeah, absolutely. So what can people do to help survivors as they transition back to a more normal life? Yeah, well, what we do with OUR is um, after the rescue, because people are, to your question, they often say, what happens after the rescue and how can we help? So the things that we help with is as we're partnering with different aftercare homes, both in the United States and around the world, we're helping improve the quality of care. And after we've already vetted aftercare homes and they've met kind of the standards that uh, you would hope that if your own child was placed there, that they would have that quality of care. We come alongside them and ask, how can we help improve the quality of care? So sometimes those are things like, we need to remodel our home and we want to create a more therapeutic environment within our home. Um, there's things like buying 15 passenger vans or creating more vocational training programs or um, creating community outings so that a child doesn't feel like they're being institutionalized within, these, within this home and they're never out in society and interacting. Yeah, And I bring those up because I think that those are areas that a lot of people can get involved if they knew how and what to do. And um, so if somebody has different things that they want to donate specifically to, if they say, I want to make sure that children around the world have the best possible mental health care and therapist available. We have those in place at all of our different aftercare homes, but they can say, I want to fund that specific need or I wanna be a part of celebrating somebody's birthday and how can I, one of the most beautiful stories, there was a six year old recently that wanted to have his birthday party. Instead of him getting gifts, he wanted survivors to get gifts. And so oh. he donated, he asked the, his friends bring money, you know, so he has all his cute little five and six year old friends bringing 10, 15, 20 dollars instead of a gift. And he said, I want my birthday to help celebrate somebody else's birthday because oh, we have survivors that we work with and aftercare homes that are there on their birthdays. And it can either be a really sad, um, depressing time or it can be a time that they remember that birthday forever. We had a little girl, we helped celebrate her birthday because she wanted to go to a um, to KFC. Uh, I, I don't know if that's a shout out to KFC, but <laughs> she <laughs> wanted to celebrate her birthday at KFC. And so we organized it and we had some different um, fun entertainment there as well. And she wanted everybody from her aftercare home to be able to join the party. So we're there. And um, that birthday party was funded by one of our donors that wanted to help with that specific need but she said something that I think will probably stick with me and and our team for for the rest of our lives where she said if birthdays are like this I want to live to be a thousand Aww. and yeah and if people had known what she had been through and her terrible trafficking story and the things that she could come to as a 10 year old and still say, if birthdays are like this, she was saying, if people can come around to me and support me and love me, I want to do this life. I want to live to be a thousand. And so I think that if people are getting educated and doing all these different things, there are ways to help out in aftercare where you can support those different specific needs. But you can also become a foster parent. I was a foster parent for a couple years for children that had been through severe neglect, abuse, and trafficking. And I would say that that was one of the times in my life. I've worked in nonprofit for 19 years, and I love what we do. And then to be able to say one of the most impactful times of my life was when I sat at the feet of these children that were living with me and learned what it meant like what it meant at three in the morning when they were having um, nightmares or mental health breakdowns and how to support them and help them heal through those things that impacted me in a way that I feel like has helped me be a better 
uh, employee at OUR and also just helping me to know how to support survivors. So I would encourage people that if you have the ability to become a foster parent, you every city in the US, you can look up therapeutic foster parents and how to become a therapeutic foster parent for kids. And that is something that can be extremely impactful. I think foster parents, you always hear about the ones on the news that are doing things that are bad or abusive or however they got on the news, but you can be the difference. Any person yeah. that has love in their heart, that has the ability to be a parent, um, has an extra room, things like that, you can get involved in forever impacting a child's life. If you're not able to do it full time, then you can be a respite parent just on the weekends. Um, you can also become a CASA, which is a court representative person that represents that child in court as sometimes they are having to um, give their testimonies at a children's justice center in different places. But there's all different ways that people can get involved. You, of course, can sign up on our website to become a volunteer, OURrescue.org. Um, you can learn about more campaigns, share this campaign. This campaign is amazing. It's a penalty it has been something that I've seen some of my friends ask me, have you heard about this? <laughs> There's this woman that's doing this, this global campaign. And I think one of the things I love about what you're doing is you're bringing unity. And I think as we come together as leaders within the anti-trafficking community and we're unifying, that's yeah. when more lives are impacted. That's when more kids are uh, removed and rescued from these different situations and aftercare happens. And I've never met, I've never met a child that has said to me, hang on now, which NGO rescued me? Yeah, I, I just really want to know which one it was. <laughs> <laughs> Survivors yeah. just want, um, I think people to be in unity and, and That's right. uh, yeah. I, you're so right. I think it's it's about coming together. It's about collaboration um, all over the world. It's it's not only the NGOs, but you know the travel and tourism industry, and you know obviously it's a penalty. We run our main campaigns during major sporting events, and we do that because they do provide a platform to get the message out all over the world. But also, we know that where there is an influx of hundreds and thousands of people you know, trafficking and exploit exploitation, unfortunately, increases. But I think, you know, um, you're right. It's, it's, it's about coming together. and We all complement each other with what we do, you see. And, it, and I think to raise awareness about it, I mean, there's a lot more awareness today about human trafficking. But one of the things that really impacted us, which is why we started the, the campaign, with Liam Neeson, uh, educating about what is what is human trafficking is, you know, a lot of people would say, well, I don't really understand what human trafficking is, but I have watched the film Taken um, uh, with Liam Neeson. And that's what gave us the idea to ask whether he would be prepared to make a, a short video just educating about what is human trafficking. Because of course, as you, as you said earlier, you know, uh, for people that have watched the film, the movie Taken, you know, story is about uh, two young girls that travel around Europe and they're abducted and trafficked and exploited into sexual exploitation. But, you know, a vast majority are, are actually trafficked within their own communities, um, you know, by people they know. And, and, you know, a lot, a lot of the stories and, and, and the, the survivors that I speak to, it's when they're sort of at high school age, when they're walking to school or, you know, that they're more vulnerable. And I think that's why it's so important that communities do come together, that, that you're working with the schools, that you're, you know, you know, how amazing that you've got young people that are becoming advocates that are actually coming together to speak out and to share and make people aware about the signs to look out for. So I, I just want to say, you know, why, why did you feel it was so important uh, for OUR to partner with us on the What is Human Trafficking campaign with Liam? Uh, well, for one, it's an amazing campaign. 
uh, like I said, bringing people together in unity. If people haven't watched the panel that you did originally, I really encourage them to go and watch that. Uh, for us to be able to partner with you guys is first a blessing, and we're very humbled to get to be a part of this campaign. Thank you for letting us. Um, it's You're doing an amazing job, and I think uh, one of our passions as well is we want – prevention to happen. We want education to happen. We don't want to have to <laughs> partner with governments and people around the world to rescue and to remove and to support and help. We would rather have the problem not exist at all. And so if there is a way that someone can say, I saw that campaign and I saw all those different trafficking organizations coming together, anti-trafficking organizations coming together and, and I thought that somebody was trying to groom me and I realized what was happening. And I told somebody or I called the national hotline. Those are the messages that you guys are spreading and that you are being one of the voices that is, that is saying, I'm going to get loud. I'm going to talk about these issues. And we know that those are hard issues to talk about. We know it's hard for people to really engage with yeah. what's happening. Um, and so we are grateful for the campaign that you are leading. We're grateful for all of the different cele celebrities and um, because their voices, they're using their voice to make an impact. Um, right. Liam is saying, I don't want everybody to just think that this movie is what trafficking is. I want people to understand that it happens in your own backyard, that it's often a boyfriend or it's often a family member that is a part of trafficking someone. And so with your campaign, you are bringing this to light and you are making it so that more people know about it and more people can find out about different NGOs and, and how they can support and get involved. So from Operation Underground Railroad, we are so grateful that we get to be a part mm -hmm. of it and just an amazing amazing campaign thank you well listen for those of you who are watching this um if you haven't seen the two minute um film that liam neeson we made with we collaborated with liam neeson on then go to know the signs now.org that's know the signs now.org and you'll you can watch the film you can share it on social media over a million people have already watched it. We want to push it out far and wide um, digitally. Um, and then uh, you can scroll down and you can learn what are the signs to look out for. And then there's also, if you keep scrolling down, there's a, there's a button that you can click on to make a report. If you suspect that you're a victim, if you suspect that you've seen something, if, um, then you can click on make a report and, and it's a penalty has developed a map of the world and wherever you are in the part of that part of the world, click on, on that town, on that city, and it will come up with different mechanisms by which you can make a report. Um, and then to keep scrolling down, you can see all the organizations. Um, as Jessica was saying earlier, we've all come together. You can learn more about them, click on their logos and find out about the amazing work they're doing. You can also find out more about the amazing work that OUR are doing as well. Um, and then also, um, Liam Neeson made a 30 second version of the two minute film. And that's going to be shown on airlines all over the world um, from the 1st of, of October, um, as well as um, throughout the Hilton hotels globally. So, and some of the airports in, in America. So, um, you know, do go to novasciencenow.org and, and get familiar with, with the film, with the campaign. So, Jessica, it just leaves me to say thank you so much for sharing about the incredible work that you guys do. And, you know, I really look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you so much for having me on. And thank you for inviting OUR to be a part of this. Thank you. Okay. Have, have a good day. Bye. Bye. Speak soon. Bye.